I'm going to talk a bit about Composer the system and some of the tools that use so this is here, closure, overtone, core async, core logic. Um, traditionally, when you talk about loose coupling in functional programming circles, you're talking about uh, decoupling functions to operating data from that pure data. Uh, but this works fairly well for small systems, specifically, especially if they're like, very academic systems. That's a, as a perfect model. But um, once you start building larger systems, more complex systems, you start needing decoupling at other levels. And the closure ecosystem has tools for writing like truly decoupled programs if you find value in coupling. Like, coupling can be good. In some cases it can be bad in other cases. We're going to take the view here that we're looking to increase coupling and therefore we're going to, are we going to, sorry, decrease coupling and therefore we're going to look into tools for decreasing coupling. So Composer is a, a system for exploring some of the rules that we use in Western music for, so what sounds nice to us in, in this part of the world is defined or is partly defined by a set of rules that you can study. Uh, and the, the Composer system is a tool designed for users to engage with these rules and, and get intuitive feel for what they mean. So instead of reading textbooks on musical rules, they explore this system and in that they gain an intuitive understanding of what some of the core rules in Western music are. The uh, Composer system is manipulated or interacted with via an OSC interface from your mobile phone. So you manipulate a set of rules on a mobile device and, and that influences uh, and lets you influence the music that's composed by the composer system and allows you to explore the different rules. The system itself is implemented in Clojure. Uh, music is played using the uh, overtone library by Sam Aaron and Core Logic is used to generate the compositions based on the selections you perform. So the interface and, and the abstraction itself is centered around the concept of uh, rules in music. There's three core rules. And don't worry if you don't understand all the music rules. I appreciate that not everyone here has a musical background. I don't. Uh, so that's it's, it's cool. Um, but the rules will, will be uh, repeated later, so, so don't worry. So the first, the primary rule is around modes. So a mode in, in music is a relationship between a set of notes so you start at one note, the one called the tonic note, the first note. And then you, uh, you jump uh, semitones or full tones over, say, a piano or whatever, to define the rest of the, uh, the notes in a mode. So a very common mode is uh, like a major scale. So in this case, I think this is the C harmonic minor scale, which is slightly more complicated or slightly more tricky to remember, I guess. The idea is you, know, you start in C if you're doing C major, and then you jump. Uh, a full note, and then you jump full note, then a, a note and a half, and so on and so forth, until you've defined all the notes in your scale. A melody that sounds nice to our ears is a permutation of those notes. So notes in a, in a common mode in Western music sounds pleasing to us uh, due to our culture and upbringing. Right? Um, so the idea is you can define a rule around selecting a specific mode, or you can, or you can leave that up to be an unbound mode, so there's no mode. Um, you can choose to bind the tonic note that defines what uh, note the, the piece is set in. Uh, and then there's a third concept that is a slightly overloaded term in this case called cadence, which states that uh, a particular note in the sequence of the, the, the mode or that gives rise to a melody, that it should be in a particular position in the generated melody. So, for example, the second to last note in a generated melody should be the fifth note of the mode you generated and then permutated. So these are three uh, different rules, uh, and they are manipulated through the OSC interface. So you load up your mobile phone app. Um, there's a, there's a keyboard, keyboard keys that allow you to set what the tonic note is. There's a selector to select between uh, five different modes, so major, harmonic minor, natural minor, locrian, and uh, fifth one, I can't remember. Uh, and there's three different types of cadence you can add as well. So the idea is you, you manipulate this interface and compose or composes new music as you do so. And those, those pieces of music will have a common characteristic that your ear can ears will pick up and you can get intuitive understanding of what is, what is this music, right? Uh, and these, this manipulation of this interface is communicated uh, to the JVM, to the clo closure process through what's called the OSC, an open sound control protocol, which is a protocol that lives on top of UDP. 
It's a very simple uh, protocol that allows you to manipulate uh, equipment during a live performance. So that's what it's designed for. In this case, you use it to manipulate uh, an abstract state of an instrument, and that instrument is a composer configuration. All right? So you manipulate a set of rules, and music happens. What does it look like? Um, I'm afraid I didn't have time to hook this up to a sound system, fortunately. Uh, but I'm trying to see if you can hear something anyway. I don't think, even think there's speakers in here. Uh, but this is what it looks like. This is me manipulating it. So. So yeah, there's a new melody being generated every time the interface is manipulated. And now I change the key. And then we had a particular type of cadence. So the more rules you add, the more it sounds like real music, right? The more restrictions you sort of put on. Uh, and when you remove the restrictions, it, it turns into a more and more chaos, basically. Um, the architecture is, is fairly simple. There's this uh, mobile device running with an OSC uh, interface on it. Uh, the OSC interface sends uh, updates when user manipulates the interface to an OSC server running inside the JVM process. The OSC server inside there uh, communicates that to a listener, so it translates, translates into something that makes sense for is in this instrument state instead of this abstract notation. Um, an instrument, there's an instrument state loop that keeps track of what instrument state we are currently in. And when that instrument state is updated, that is communicated back to the OSC interface. The OSC interface doesn't actually update until it's made the round trip uh, all the way through the JVM. Uh, it's also communicated down to a composition loop, which utilizes core logic to uh, compose new pieces of music. And those new pieces of music are sent through to the overtone loop, uh, uh, queued for playing the next time around. So the overtone loop will finish playing the current piece of melody, and then iterate on the new, next piece of melody, and, and so on and so forth. I'm going to come back into how this coordination, hap coordination happens, because that's one of the interesting things. But before we get there, I'm going to return to coupling and talk a bit about what, what is it we mean by coupling. Right, so this is, this is, the, this is the, uh, so the, 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 the canvas we're going to talk about coupling on. We're going to paint a picture of coupling on. So if you look up on Wikipedia, coupling in software architecture normally talks about the degree of direct knowledge there is between software components, or some sort of abstract software components in your system or in your, your program. And traditionally, what we think about when we think about uh, decoupling uh, components or loose coupling. I, our thoughts turn to program to interfaces rather than implementations, right? If you program to an interface, I, uh, you make no implicit assumptions about uh, A or B's implementation, like what, how they operate, right? So there's a loose coupling between the top component there, the user of the implementations down the bottom, A or B. When you do that, it's a bit of a mess if the top component has to instantiate a or B, right? So you start seeing things like dependency injection getting into OO. So you uh, declare centrally somewhere how uh, your system should be built, what building blocks should be there, uh, and dependency injection makes that happen, instantiates your system for you, right? Uh, you still have to hold on to a component in the top component for that to happen, right? It still has to communicate directly to components. So there's still some sort of coupling, albeit be between a implementation and interface, but there's still some sort of coupling. Uh, you can how to get away with that coupling on an alternative way to, to achieve low coupling is by having a centralized message bus in your running process. That's something you know from uh, in, in the iOS framework, uh, people use, use, the, use the notification center. If you're running uh, like Ruby stuff, maybe you have like a Redis queue somewhere. Like there's loads of message buses of different, different sorts for decoupling um, components. Right? You just put something on a bus, bus and then you check it later to see if anything returned or you don't check it at all because you don't care about what happens. Uh, there's also stuff like closures and blocks. If you look at, uh, for example, Ruby, right, the, a closure of code becomes a, a, a decoupled component. You don't care about the concrete implementation and the closure you execute is passed into a module of some sort. You execute it on your internal state, and, and uh, you don't care about the side effects it has or whatever manipulation happens. Right, so you're decoupling uh, those two components from a uh, more sort of code uh, clean perspective, you can use namespaces to, to 
indicate to other programmers, if nothing else, that uh, these modules, these components, you only talk to other components on the same level. So if you use the Java packages or whatever, right, uh, it is generally accept, accepted wisdom, I guess, that um, classes within the same package should only really know about other packages in there to a certain degree, right? So you use namespaces to to f formally indicate to other programmers that you desire low coupling in this part of your software. It ties back to the keynote we had this morning, right? You don't want a lot of cycles, right? You don't want cycles all the place. If you do have cycles, you're not going to keep them to a top package namespace, right? And namespaces also take other forms like uh, prefixes in class names and Objective C or stuff like that. And then there's a slightly more aggressive decoupling happening when you have uh, distributed systems. For example, there's a, there's a high degree of decoupling between your browser and the web server serving a request, right? There's, there's a multitude of servers that actually answer a request when you hit a load balancer somewhere. You don't care about the complete implementations there. Your server shouldn't care about them being uh, Apache or Nginx or whatever. Who cares, right? So it's a, a side level of decoupling between these things. So these, are some of the, these are some of the things that crop up when you think about coupling in traditional software development. But my point is there's some other uh, decoupling mechanisms in enclosure uh, that we can use if we desire uh, low coupling. I'm going to go through three of those now. I'm going to de demonstrate uh, how they work, and I'm going to demonstrate how they have been used in um, the Composer system. So the first one I'm going to talk about, we've already seen today, if, you've, if you were at the previous uh, CSP talk. Um, so communicating sequential processes is a, uh, is a way of, of achieving decoupling. The idea is, the motivation is, you decouple what needs to happen at some point in your system from who executes that work, who actually performs that work. Then this allows you to control capacity in your system. You can tune different parts of your system to achieve uh, better, better utility. Uh, and it, you, it can help you avoid stuff like callbacks if you uh, use them in, in stuff like JavaScript. The basic idea is that you start a process, or you start one or more processes that consume from channels, buffer channels somewhere, take off work, perform some work, and put it back on other channels. Uh, and controlling the size of, of these uh, buffers that's in these channels and controlling the overflow strategies in these channels allow you to uh, decouple that sort of decisions like control flow decisions from your actual implementation of, say, business logic or you know, whatever it is you're trying to do. Right? So you're decoupling how things are, how, how information flow is managed through your system from the components that perform that computation. Um, and again, it allows you to, to be explicit about stuff like overflow strategies. What do you do when too many messages are coming and you can't handle them all? Do you drop the oldest one? Do you drop the new ones? Do you blow up? Uh, how, how large a buffer do you want? And the idea is, of course, that each component that operates on channels and puts stuff back on other channels don't care about who put that stuff on that channel and who consumes the stuff on the channel on the other end. Right, so similar to a message bus. Uh, as an example, consider a, a channel with a buffer size of 10, say, where you have a process continuously picking uh, items off that channel as they come in and uh, calculating an average over the last n uh, values that it saw. When it gets those values, it puts them down on another channel here that only has a size of one. When, that, uh, when, it, when there's a value in there, uh, but we try to put a new value in, we should just throw the old one away. So we have a sliding window strategy in that channel, which means we're always only interested in picking up the last element from this channel. We have a different uh, process here, which picks up that value that comes in uh, 60 times uh, a second and updates an external window uh, based, based on that. So there's no reason to update a window more than 60 times a second because we wouldn't be able to register it with our hardware anyway. So this allows us to not do expensive I.O. for no reason, uh, not, to utilize, uh, not to use CPU we don't, we don't need. Um, and we can make all these decisions explicit in, in the wiring, in the construction of, of, of our program. Uh, and again, each of these, each these loops have no idea about what goes down the other loops. Like this thing, could, could update a display from any channel. It's not, it's not wired to calculating averages. It's a, very, it's a very simple example, of course, but it scales quite well. The implementation is uh, quite short and sweet. Um, this is the entire thing. Right, there's a function, the biggest function is the one for actually creating the window. Uh, this function initiates, initiates a, a loop, which updates this thing 65 times a second. It only can, uh, depends on a channel. It takes stuff from, 
and the function is recalled to update the window. There's uh, some producers that produce stuff to put on this, this magical channel here. There's a, um, there's a update window function that keeps, keeps hold of, of like a window over a set of values all the time. And then there's an average loop that doesn't know anything about anything else but the value channel and average channel just, just runs. Why all to, together it takes a massive um, lit statement. Once you have that up and running, this is what you get. It's, um, it opens a window. These producers run independently. There's 10 producers running at the same time. It's easy to scale up, have, have more uh, processes hammering the same channel, and just continues right. Um, right. So, None of these loops, none of these processes know anything about the overall wiring. Like that, that is centralized, explicitly stated here in one massive, slightly horrendous LED statement. Right. Um, in Composer, uh, each of these things called a loop, the instrument state loop, a composed loop, an overtone loop, each of those are, are taking things off channels and putting them on other channels or doing something else with them. As an example, the overtone loop doesn't really know anything about where the melodies come from. It just knows that when a new melody arrives, it should, it should play that melody. At the same time, the channel that lives here between the composer and the overtone loop uh, need only contain one element, like we're only interested in the latest composition. When you update the interface, you want to have the latest composition based on that state in which you have put the interface, right? So this, this channel that lives between these two should drop, drop uh, old melodies. When new melodies come in, we're always only interested in one last melody, right? That, that overtone loop, loop doesn't know anything about this, right? You could change that strategy, and it wouldn't know. That's decoupled. The thing knows nothing about composed loop upstream. It only knows about uh, playing, playing music. Uh, and you get a quite short and sweet implementation as well uh, of a sequential process that just does the same thing, loops, 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 loops. Right? And for debugging this is, and development, this is particularly handy in that you can just especially uh, put stuff on that melody channel to, to try it out without depending on the rest of your infrastructure being wired up already. Right? You can hook in, you just have to operate on channels, you can lock them or just put things directly on them. You don't need to set up the rest of the system. It's quite, it's quite sweet. The next principle uh, is about the internal wiring as of, of your, your programs as, as a data structure. So as you saw before, there was a, there was a massive let statement to put all this stuff together. And that, quite quickly become somewhat of a miss. So there's this related um, principle or set of tools for, for centralizing that wiring and making it explicit, explicit as, a, as a graph, basically. Uh, and it allows you to make the wiring declarative and, and, and to do wiring analysis. So you can see, are there any cyclic dependencies in my software? Uh, and once you have that graph, you can instantiate a, uh, a running instance of your system, in this case inside your JVM, and keep your old, all your state in, in one place. So I won't get too much into detail, but there's quite interesting talks by um, Stuart Sierra and Malcolm Sparks around, around doing this. Um, so the idea is you make, you make a scaffold, almost. you make a, you know, a template of, of your running system as a, as a graph, and then you ask the system to instantiate such a, such a graph uh, this gives you a running system, and this running system you can, you can play around with. And when you want to terminate it or restart it, you can explicitly stop it. It, it will empty any connection pools, kill any uh, web services or anything you have running in that thing, while still being hosted inside the JVM, and you can start a new one. So you also avoid all this uh, JVM tarnishing that can be quite annoying when doing closure development. As an example, uh, here's a web server that serves an incrementing counter that's incremented every time we serve the root. The uh, counter itself is, in this case, hosted as an atom, represented as an atom in our, in our graph. There's two functions that depend on this atom. There's a read function that returns the current count of this thing as an increment function. Um, defining those, they only need to know about the atom, so it's easy enough. There's a handler that uh, needs to know about incrementing and reading because it needs to increment when it's called, it needs to read off, say, what the current count is. And there's a server that only uh, depends on knowing about this handler. Right. So each of these things is explicit, extremely easy to read, which components depends on which components here in, in, when you write in this manner, instead of just writing them sequentially in your program and assuming that the other programmers will be able to see what depends on what. And again, the implementation is quite short and sweet. This is all of it. Uh, 
We use flow here for defining uh, the graph and for starting it up afterwards. Flow allows you to define dependencies between these uh, subcomponents. There are uh, this is, it's written by Stuart Serra, the, uh, the flow system. He's since written other systems that are slightly more elaborate, and Jig by Malcolm Sparks is also slightly more elaborate, but this is like the, the, the shortest way of, of, of expressing this. But if you're interested in, in doing more advanced stuff, I'll give that a look. So you can see it's, it's just explicitly stated here to say that uh, the counter doesn't uh, depend on anything. It's just an atom of zero. The server depends on a handler. A handler depends on read and increment. Read and increment each depends on counter. And all these relationships are just automatically uh, populated and everything is set up for you when you ask a system to run. Right? And when you ask the system to stop, it checks if the server is running and then explicitly stops the server running at port 8080 so you don't have polluted uh, ports or bound, bound ports. And you run it, um, yeah, you just run a system, you check that you can actually update the thing, you can stop it again, you can start it again, your counter will now be reset and you can you can do it again, right? So the entire state of, of your running process is, is, uh, is restarted. And the, the idea is right, that when you decouple stuff other places in your system, you still need to wire everything together at some point. And this is where the wiring lives. The wiring lives uh, explicitly somewhere in a place that we can reason about, where we can perform system analysis, automated system analysis on this, on this thing. Cool. What does it look like in, oh, in a composer? So in Composer, all this wiring, setting up the, all these things, by putting up all the channels between these loops and everything, it's all done in one short piece of code. There's a flow definition that says, uh, for example, the instrument state channel, that's the channel that hangs off uh, the instrument state loop. The instrument state channel should actually be a broadcast channel that should broadcast two other channels. It should broadcast out to the uh, OSC instrument state channel, which is this one, and it should a broadcast out to the composer instrument state channel is the right one going on to a composer loop. So this allows us to split up messages to two interested parties. Uh, the dashed lines indicate that these are sliding buffers on here of size one, which means we only retain newest items. So for the OSC listener, that means that the interface you get updated down here, right, will always be the latest interface. You'll never get messages for old interfaces when your messages are available. Right. So the idea is that we can make all this wiring explicit, we can make our choices around uh, buffer strategies explicit and uh, centralized, which may or may not be what you want, right? But if that's, if that's a, qu a quality in your eyes, you can get that through using uh, flow wiring. Um, the last uh, decoupling strategy is a bit more tongue in cheek. I, uh, logic programming is used to actually uh, generate the compositions in, in Composer. So the uh, motivation here is that the act of searching for music to, to play is uh, distinct and different from the act of defining what a harmonic piece of music sounds like. It's two different things. You shouldn't, the, the search algorithm shouldn't know, or doesn't need to know at least, about uh, what a piece of music is. And the piece of, uh, definition of a piece of music doesn't need to know about the, the search algorithm, how the search algorithm operates. Right? Those two software components do not need to be coupled. You can avoid that by using uh, methods such as declarative programming. It's done here, right? So in logic programming, you define a set of restrictions and uh, constraints, and you define these uh, constraints. You build complex constraints from simple constraints, a bit like stacking Legos, basically. Right? So you have a set of simple constraints that can allow you to build larger constraints, and uh, the logic engine will give you uh, universes back for which those constraints are satisfied. So it sort of equates what you do when you write SQL expressions, right? You write, um, you describe your desired state of the world, uh, and that desired state is taken out to a data store, and what you get back is uh, the part of the world that adheres to that, to that um, desired state. Right? The difference here is that the desired state, the data store, all of a sudden isn't a database, it's uh, the infinite universe. Uh, so you're asking for solutions to a set of constraints you define without any underlying data store. Right? That's, that's, that's an analogy at, the, at least. Uh, and the, the clear thing is it couples what you're interested in, in figuring out from how you're going to figure it out. Right? And as an example, we're going to look at um, a palindrome. So a palindrome is a, um, 
is a text string or a sequence that uh, reads the same from one end, uh, going from left to right, as goes from right to left. Uh, and again, we can build this um, the set of constraints from simpler constraints. So we're going to build it using first a helper constraint called botlaster, which dictates that um, uh, the string L or the sequence L is uh, everything but the last element and then the last element. Right? It's a bit like if you know logic programming, it's like a console which indicates, which dictates that the string L is the first element followed by the rest of the elements. Right? So this is this is the opposite. Right? And given that, we can define reverso uh, recursively. So reverso says that two sequences are the re reverse of each other if the last element is the same uh, and if the sequence minus the, fir the last element, the first sequence, sequence minus the fir uh, last element, and the second sequence minus the, the first element, if they're also the same, that's, um, that means that uh, it's the reverse of each other, right? So it's a, it's a recursive constraint definition, which you can't do in SQL, right? But it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite interesting. And again, nothing is bound here. We're just, we're just talking about um, what constraints constraints need to be satisfied in a, in a perfect universe, in the universe we're interested in, for core logic to generate for us. So what does this look like in, in code? So we have, a function, we have a constraint, a function for creating constraint called botLast, which takes an unbound logical variable botLast, it takes a, a, a logical variable called last, and it takes a logical variable called uh, L, and, indicate, and it uh, uses a, another constraint, a pendo, to to create the constraint that uh, L is but last appended to last that single element, right? So there's a helper, helper constraint called appendo in the core logic core that you can use for this stuff. Reverso is the, divided into uh, different pattern matching matched clauses. So uh, the empty the sequence is the reverse of the empty sequence. The sequence only containing one element is the reverse of the same sequence containing the, the same one element. This makes this gives you uh, uneven length and even length uh, lists. Those are two base cases. Then, if you have two sequences, S1 and S2, uh, S1 is the reverse of S2, as we said before. If uh, the last element is the same as the first element, and if you can recur and, and it, it still holds true, so we introduce four fresh logical variables A, B, C, and D. So. A is the first part of S1, and B is the last element. C is the first element of S2, and D is the rest. Uh, A should be equal to D, and B should be the reverse of C, recursively. And it doesn't matter, technically it doesn't matter in which order you define these. It does matter in that uh, the logic engine that runs through it afterwards uh, doesn't do depth breath, uh, breath first search, unfortunately. Um, so it can, it can hurt performance to, uh, to um, change the order of these constraints, but technically there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, and then finally we define our palindromo constraint, which says that um, S is a palindrome if S is the reverse of S. Right, so it's an extremely declarative way of putting it, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, take up that much space to actually declare these things. Um, how, how does it look when we use this thing, right? So there's a function called run that you feed a logic program and it will tell you, um, it'll give you a list of all the universes when you use one star that satisfy the constraints you've set up. So in the first example, we've said, okay, uh, in the universe Q, for a logic variable Q in the universe, uh, for which set values of Q is one, two, one, a palindrome. As you can see, the response is uh, underscore one. Underscore one basically says Q can be underscore one. Underscore one is an unbound thing. It can be anything you want. Like if, if Q is uh, the text string hello world, that's fine. If Q is uh, the number 42, that's fine. We don't care. In any universe you can mention, no matter what you set Q to be, one, two, one will be a palindrome. Right? So by not having Q being a part of what we're trying to feed in, we just get a true false in something actually a palindrome. Uh, a different example, if we, if we check with something that's actually not a palindrome, we get the empty list out because there's no universe, no matter 
what value you assign to Q, uh, if, it, if it's a string of one to one or whatever it is, right? It doesn't matter what you change Q into being. That does not make the statement one two is a palindrome true, right? Does that make sense? Q is not related to one two being a palindrome or not. Those two things are completely unrelated. You can't manipulate Q and make the other thing true. Right, so that's just that's just for checking stuff. Right? You can just give in Q in that you're not interested in and see what happens. It gets more interesting when the, log when the logic variable Q becomes a part of, of your constraints. So if you say uh, Q is unbound, but I'm interested in seeing uh, for which 10 uh, universes of Q is Q a, a palindrome. Or just give me 10 of those. And uh, call logic will go out and uh, declare it to be construct universes which are true. So if Q is the empty sequence, then Q is a palindrome. If Q is the sequence of only one element, then that element is zero. Uh, that's, that is unbound. That means you can replace zero with anything, and whatever's there would be a palindrome, right? If uh, if Q if underscore zero is hello world, then that is that is you know a palindrome by strict definition, because hello world is just seen as one element in that sequence. Uh, the repetition of of, of uh, two unbounds is also a palindrome. So AA is a palindrome, BB is a palindrome. So it's, we're expressing like a we're getting we're getting um, a class of worlds out here. It's not instances; it's classes of worlds, right? Uh, and we get further down to get more advanced. So, unbound should be the same as last unbound. This unbound should be the same as this unbound. This unbound should be the same. So that could be A B C B A. It could be A B B B B A. Or it could be A A A A A A. Right? We we haven't restricted that. Right? There's nothing indicating that these unbound logical variables uh, have to be have to be different. Uh, as you see, the coupling. Uh, gives us gives us power to not care about you know, um, what's input and what's output, right? Or just just taking something if it's true or not. Well, that's that's just binding Q to nothing. Or we're trying to generate solutions to to worlds. Well, that's that's uh, that's what happens when you put Q into into your expressions, and you can combine it. It, uh, it combines uh, perpendicularly. I mean, you can you can put any constraints next to each other. And those constraints don't need to know anything about each other. So these software components that these constraints are, they are completely decoupled, right? So if you're saying, I want Q instead of palindrome, but A has to be a member of Q and B has to be a member of Q, member row and palindrome has no idea about each other, right? They are completely unrelated. Uh, but you can combine them with, uh, with no knowledge and, and generate worlds in which uh, Q is a palindrome and A and B are in those. And you can you, you can do this with all the functions as well. You can say, give me all the palindromes Q that are a permutation of, of this string, and it'll just generate uh, worlds for you, or strings for you in this case, right? So how does this look in the composition framework? So how, how do you translate uh, this sort of sequence manipulation to, uh, to musical composition? So the three rules we defined before are all encapsulated in, in, this, in this piece of code. Um, the first bit, the green bit here, is pure normal closure. It only concerns itself with uh, defining what it means to be uh, different modes. So major scale, for example, so it just specifies it's a tone, tone, a semitone, a tone, 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 a semitone. Um, Locrian mode is slightly more complex. Right? So these are just uh, boring definitions of, not boring, sorry. Uh, they're just definitions of, of different modes. Uh, down here, there's a restriction of the tonic node called key, key uh, restriction, it just specifies that uh, so not yeah if if, the, if if this thing is set, then the key should be um, specifically this one key. The red bit down here has to do with cadence. So you can see if we are having a perfect cadence, that means that the second to last note of the melody should be the uh, should be the fifth note in the in the scale of our of our of our mode. Uh, the only place we actually do call out into call logic is in the blue bit. So in the blue bit, and in particular in the Scaleo bit, uh, is where we define the relationship between a base node, a scale, and then the nodes in that uh, base node scale configuration. Right? So we define uh, this relation recursively as we saw before, but it's slightly, slightly more complex. But basically what happens is, we traverse uh, the, the scale and the nodes conc uh, concurrently 
until we reach uh, the end of the of the scale. Um, and how how can we use this? So we we've seen it being used in the the composer framework, but we can you know as it as it doesn't depend on the rest of the composer framework, right? We can we can use it in any context. We can play around with it using uh, core logic itself. Right, so we can say, I right, give me all the uh, universes of nodes where the nodes or the C uh, major scale and there's eight nodes. So the first eight nodes of the C major scale. And I will return exactly that. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Right. C major is one of the simpler scales. It's just the white keys after C in this case. Um, and we can run it. We can run it. Uh, we can do slightly more interesting stuff. We can say, right, okay, give me uh, three pieces set in C major. So a piece is a permutation of the nodes of C major and they should end and start on C, start and end on, on C, right? That's, that's the definition of, uh, of melody set in a piece, in a center node mode. Um, and again, we can run it backwards so we can uh, extract the binary representation of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a mode. So a mode is just defined as either we hit the key or we skip a key. So hit key, skip, no oh, hit note, skip note, hit note, skip note, hit note, hit note, skip note, right? So we can, we can extract the uh, the pattern of of uh, a concurrent uh, the, um, an instance of a, of a mode. Right. So to recap, the closure ecosystem has has two ecosystem has tools for writing truly decoupled programs. If that is what you desire, if you desire low coupling, and Composer embodies three of these uh, decoupling strategies, which allows it to have a very small code base, for one thing, to be very easy to read and reason about. I find at least. And uh, to be responsive in that we, do, we don't have to waste any time performing uh, compositions or coming up with compositions while users use the interface because we're, we're you know, skipping stuff all the time. If you're interested in, uh, in reading more about the slightly more uh, it, academic part of, of this work, if you want to read up on some of the experiments that lie behind this thing, there's an article out uh, in the ICFP proceedings we can look into. There's also a talk that covers those aspects of this work uh, available for you. Uh, if you're interested in the code itself, it's available on GitHub, uh, listed somewhere. There it is, in TDK slash uh, composer. Um, so you can have a look, play around, uh, and look, check out the references that, that are in there. Um, whoops, just needs to find a mouse. We're running. Slight, slightly behind time, so I sorry I rushed uh, through a bit maybe, but um, that's all I have to say about three decoupling strategies in Composer uh, that you can use yourself in, in Clojure. Uh, if there are any questions, but you're eager to come out and get some, get out and get some coffee, I'll, I'll hang around today and tomorrow. So feel free to uh, to drop by and have a, have a chat. And uh, thank you. <laughs>